So uh, before jumping into the diet, let's discuss briefly about cancer. So uh, you can see here a normal cell, the blue one on top, normal cell with normal genes, normal DNA, RNA structures, okay? Cancer causing agents. Can you name few cancer causing agents in the chat box? According to you, what are the things which may lead to cancer? One minute. tobacco pollution, free radicals, environmental factors, highly processed food, too many preservatives in food, lack of physical activities, not including fresh fruits and vegetables in your diet. Fruits and vegetables that are not organic, that are like mass produced, pesticides, etc. Yeah. So there are n number of environmental factors. When these factors reach into your body, okay, they try to trigger your DNA. Okay. Your DNA has certain uh, anti-cancer agents to identify any mutation taking place and to suppress that. But if it is not working, if your if your immunity is weak, or you have any other uh, issues, okay? Your uh, your natural immunity to prevent uh, or to suppress the neoplasmic mutations taking place, okay? That doesn't work. So what happens here is that the DNA will undergo mutation, okay? Oncogene will be activated. So normal DNA will now have activated oncogene. Oncogene means onco means what? Anything related to cancer. Okay, anything related to cancer is oncogene, is onco, the word onco. So we are talking about genetics here, how cancer will change your DNA structure. Okay, so it is because of oncogene. Oncogene will cause the mutation in your DNA. Okay, now the DNA has an activated oncogene and the DNA, whichever cell it is present, that cell becomes the cancer cell that will proliferate, that will divide and um, increase in number, okay? They, they will proliferate, they will undergo various differentiation. They may stick to a, 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 uh, the same tissue being a benign cancer. Sometimes they may move on to other tissues, other organs, then we call it as a malignant cancer. So this is the pathogenesis of cancer. External factors, cancer causing the agents, will cause genetic mutations with the help of oncogenes, okay? And then this oncogene will convert that normal cell into cancer cell. Wherever, whichever normal cell where this activation of oncogene has took place, that becomes a cancer cell, okay? So different types of cancer depending on the location of cancer where it is generated, okay? So we have carcinoma, a cancer of the epithelial cells like skin, mouth, throat, breast, lungs, okay? Wherever the epithelial cells are involved, we call it as carcinoma, okay? Sarcoma, when the connective tissues like bone, muscle, blood is also a connective tissue, blood is a fluid connective tissue, but whatever cancer is associated with blood, we, it will come under the section of leukemia, okay? So ex except from blood, bone, muscle, okay? Any other connective tissues like your cartilage, Okay, if, uh, if cancer is involved in that area, we call it as sarcoma. Leukemia, cancer of blood-forming organs, spleen, bone marrow, 
white blood cells, etc. Okay, then lymphoma, when your lymphatic system is involved, especially your lymph nodes, okay, lymph nodes, lymph vessels, the uh, tonsils are limbs, okay, you have a lot of limbs near your underarms, axillary region, inguinal region, groin region, okay, there are many lymph nodes present in these areas. So when a cancer starts in this lymph nodes, it's a lymphoma because with the name itself, we will know which all areas are affected in this particular cancer, okay? Coming to risk factors, see, risk factors for different cancers are different, but we are just brushing through the general risk factors, okay? First is hereditary. As I told earlier, Cancer causing genes are inherently present in, some, in one's body, but uh, if both the parents, mother and fa father, both of them have a family history of cancer, okay, they will be carrying these cancer causing genes. And when they have an offspring, the offspring also has increased chances now because the off off offspring has acquired the cancer causing genes from both the sides of the family. So that's how heredity plays, okay, uh, its role in giving cancer. Then we have environmental factors. Lots of environmental factors are there. We will discuss that uh, in coming up, okay. Dietary factors that will be, uh, that will again we will discuss in the coming up session. Estrogens, uh, during the postmenopausal period, a hormonal replacement therapy, HRT, goes on, okay, uh, for all the women who are reaching their menopause or they have attained menopause, so that there is no, no, no drastic change, their bone health should be healthy. So for all these reasons, estrogen therapy is given. But there has been a drawback to this estrogen therapy. Giving estrogen in high doses after menopause has shown some link with breast cancer. Okay, so estrogen, uh, give um, too much of a high doses or uncontrolled doses of estrogen or when the patient themselves have to take estrogen supplements or estrogen shots, sometimes the doses may vary with, uh, with respect to what they can get from a hospital or a medical practitioner. Uh, so in that case, estrogen has shown some relation, some association with the development of breast cancer and cervical cancer in women after menopause. Then metabolic sy uh, syndrome, uh, especially if uh, pancreatitis, okay, if your pancreas are under, going under inflammation, if you have a history of hepatitis, okay, these all are metabolic disorders. They do affect the metabolism of the body. In future, there are chances of getting the cancer under the same organs. Then age, with age, does the risk of cancer increase or decrease? You can answer in the chat box. With age, does the risk of cancer increase or decrease? Yes, it increases. It definitely increases. The increase rate is about six times. A person who is in, in their 40s, a person who is in their 60s, when you compare that, the person who is in their 60s have six times higher rate Okay, higher chance of acquiring cancer. Okay. Physical activity, decreased physical activity, higher risk of getting cancer. Then immune factor, as I told earlier, our body has some antibodies, anti-carcinogenic agents in our body itself. Okay. So, um, they, they are able to suppress, they, they will be continuously detecting uh, is there any mutation going on or is there any carcinogenic uh, agents that have entered the body okay and they will try to trap these agents and take it out of the body uh, with detoxification effect etc okay so when the immune factors are down <coughs> for example if somebody is on immunosuppressant therapy for a long time or they have um, aids okay uh, they have been infected with hiv and aids they have higher chance of acquiring cancer. So coming to environmental factors, ionizing radiations like alpha, gamma, uh, gamma rays, beta rays, okay, any type of ionizing radiation 
okay radiation that uh, that has charged particles radiation that has ions in it okay that which is used in radiation therapy or even in diagnostic radiation etc they uh, ultraviolet radiation also from the sunlight okay they have the tendency to give cancer which kind of cancer do you think ultraviolet radiation can give sunlight which country has the largest rate of skin cancer yes yeah, skin cancer right which country yeah it is australia okay it is because of the population dynamic the natives of the australia before australia was colonized they do not have the increased uh, tendency of getting um, skin cancer but it was it is the caucasians the colonies who colonized australia okay uh, the white people they have the higher tendency of getting sunburn and skin uh, skin cancer because ethnically speaking caucasians were supposed to be uh, uh, dwelling in the areas which doesn't uh, get too much of sunlight but australia being too close to the equator it has a lot of sunlight and that is why environmentally caucasians are not well adjusted to the australian climate so that is why we see such high rate of skin cancers okay then we have chemical substances like uh, tobacco okay benzene asbestos uh, nicotine okay these things which are uh, used in any any forms of substance, substance abuse like smoking alcoholism okay all those chemical substances will lead to some or other kind of cancer usually it is lung cancer and liver cancer then viruses human papilloma virus very important question okay underline that uh, environment uh, on page number 487 viruses okay that's an important paragraph which all are the virus that can cause cancer human papilloma virus epstein barr virus okay and in some cases we, it is not yet proven it is not yet proven but some studies do suggest that hepatitis b virus will also cause a uh, cancer okay but it has been proven about human papilloma virus and epstein barr virus please underline that paragraph or mark that page number 487 those who do not have the textbook just note it down somewhere else about the viruses that cause cancer especially in women they ca cause cervical cancer human papilloma papilloma virus and epstein barr virus it will lead to cervical cancer then stress it is another factor stress will cause a lot of oxidation in your body at various levels levels and too many oxidations within your body means too many free radicals on top of that if you do not have antioxidants to combat these free radicals your chances of getting cancer is high then dietary factors yeah meat uh, which meat do you think can cause cancer has the highest risk of con uh, causing cancer there are different types of meat right red meat clean meat white meat yes red meat like from beef pork etc lamb okay uh, and uh, the main thing here is uh, red meat itself is not the uh, culprit here natural meat is not the culprit but the way how you process the meat okay you get meat from uh, not from directly from the farmers or butchers but you get meat in packages okay processed meat when you get in packages and all those things are the culprit here okay natural meat doesn't have too much of tendency to cause cancer until and unless it is overcooked or it is treated in high temperature okay then it it can lead to cancer forming agents otherwise natural meat doesn't cause cancer as such but processed meat meat yes and cooking meat at high temperature okay high like deep frying okay these things will lead to uh, cancer forming agents on the surface of the meat okay so that's how meat is a culprit here and then we have energy balance like for example your body mass index obese people have the highest rate of getting cancer than lean people then sugars uh, 
dwelling uh, too much on sugars okay excess amount of sugar in your diet excessive starch rich food in your diet excess in excess remember that word if it is excess okay then coming to fat fat rich food okay whatever which uh, sugars and fat both will lead to obesity so these are all also the culprits some uh, forms of protein not all forms okay some forms of protein which is uh, which is found in red meat okay that can cause cancer vitamins and minerals uh, there has been association that people who are deficient in vitamin c okay they have higher risk of getting oropharyngeal cancer uh, oral cancer stomach cancer esophageal cancer okay people who have less uh, beta carotene in their blood okay the carotenoid levels are very less in their blood they have higher risk of lung cancer so various vitamins and minerals are associated with the uh, risk of different kind of cancer deficiencies of these vitamins and minerals alcohol yeah needless to say alcohol is uh, substance abuse of alcohol will lead to liver cirrhosis and if it goes into the stage of complication or liver cirrhosis is been there in a chronic stage from a chronic period it can convert into a uh, liver cancer then nitrates uh, nitrates again are used to process meat etc okay sodium nitrate potassium nitrate these are used as food food flavorants and uh, it enhances the texture of certain foods etc so these are the causative agents for various types of cancers like uh, when you uh, in in the manufacturer level okay not at home level okay not the pickles which you make at home but when you buy pickles from outside okay most probably it will be processed with nitrates to get the to uh, enhance the flavor okay to uh, for salting pickling purposes and all they will use nitrates so that's a culprit here then aflatoxin is a fungi okay that grows on cereals and groundnuts and it is associated with lung uh, sorry liver cancer then beta carotene supplement beta carotene is naturally it should be there in in the blood system to a healthy level but for a person who is already suffering from lung cancer okay people who are already suffering from lung cancer when they were provided with beta carotene supplement the cancer the the stage and the severity of the cancer it deteriorated okay it caused uh, more symptoms and more distress to the patient okay aflatoxin is a fungi it's a fungi it is found on cereals and groundnuts if uh, there is humidity which is trapped in uh, cereals while storing the cereals or groundnuts uh, this kind of fungi may grow okay and it is associated with liver cancer so these are the different factors again uh, i'm repeating the same thing uh different factors uh has uh different cancers have different risk factors okay different uh, all these uh, different uh, risk factors which we have discussed right now it will lead to different types of cancer maybe carcinoma sarcoma lung liver depending on the organs involved etc okay there is no uh, sure cut way to it so the researches are still going on on various degree okay some vaccines are also being de developed especially for the vir uh, viruses that cause cancer okay for that vaccines are still under research to prevent cervical cancer so this is important take a screenshot of this caution caution is a mnemonic which we can use to identify the seven main signs and symptoms which may suggest that a person may be suffering from cancer okay when you see all individually if you see individually these signs and symptoms not all together and if you see all together means it's a warning sign but even individually if you see these signs and symptoms not together which is uh, it, when it is not presented together but even in individual pockets here and there it, you should undergo some body check up you can translate this information to uh, your friends and family also so take a screenshot of this caution caution is a mnemonic which we can use so c st stands for change in the bowel or bladder habits okay for example uh, 
from many years at a certain point of time in the morning as soon as they wake up or after they have a cup of tea or something they used to go out, go to empty the uh, bowel but that bit has been changing it is the bowel is not working as before or now now they are going to the bathrooms and uh, toilets in the middle of the day not uh, not following the usual routine okay that's a common sign that's one sign when the bladder happens the bowel habits suddenly change then a sore uh, that does not heal a wound that doesn't heal okay so a, a tiny sore or wound in the skin uh, usually in the mucosal lining of the body, like your mouth, inside the mouth, etc. Uh, those never heal, okay? That's a sign of oral cancer. U stands for unusual bleeding or discharge. These discharges or bleeding may be from the bladder, vagina, rectum, okay? It can lead to, um, mean uh, it can mean different types of cancer, like prostate cancer in men, cervical in women, colorectal cancer in both, okay? Think uh, T stands for thickening or lump in the breast or elsewhere. If the lump is present in the breast, it can suggest to breast cancer or it can, it may be benign or malignant. Uh, you have to take a biopsy for that, biopsy test for that. If the lump is found in the testes or the testicle, it means testicular cancer. I stands for indigestion or dysphagia. Dysphagia means difficulty in swallowing. Okay, so that's a symptom for any cancer associated with the upper GI tract, that's the mouth, esophagus, uh, upper part of the stomach, fundus of the stomach, etc. Then um, if you already have certain moles or warts on your body, which you know uh, from, from a very long period of time, it, it is in a, in a correct shape or size, or you, ha you have seen it daily on a daily basis, etc. But suddenly within the uh, within few weeks or months, you see a change in its shape Okay, it is decreasing or its texture is not same as before. Okay, that's a sign for skin cancer. Then N stands for nagging cough or hoarseness in the voice. Okay, even without any cough or even without any, any throat infection, the person may, uh, the person's voice may change. Okay, person's voice may change and it, there will be a visible warts or uh, hoarseness uh, in the voice, which you can identify and say, and you may ask them on a, on a regular basis, are you suffering from a throat infection? Are you suffering from cough or cold? Your voice is sounding quite diff different like that. Okay, so nagging cough or hoarseness in the voice. That can indicate to lung cancer or throat cancer. Then coming to the general, general systemic uh, reactions, abnormalities in the metabolism. Like once you have diagnosed someone with cancer, the first thing will be abnormal weight loss. Okay, um, it can be uh, because of the mental depression they may be going through once they know they're suffering from uh, such a disorder. Okay, or that or there may be some other causes like they may be on certain medications which is making them anorexic, okay? And which leads to uh, loss of appetite, weight loss, muscle wa uh, wasting, etc. Okay, then anorexia, as told earlier, some antidepressants may also cause anorexia, okay? Uh, some prescription dis uh, 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 antidepressants, anorexia is a side effect for that, okay? Then uh, when a person is suffering from anorexia, automatically the body requires carbohydrates. The body requires glucose for its functioning. So what the body does is it will rely on the muscles and tissues for giving up glucose. Okay, so that's how muscle wasting takes place. Then we have malabsorption, especially when the cancer patients are on certain medications. Okay, and if, uh, if the cancer is in the GI tract, malabsorption is one of the uh, one of the uh, symptoms which you can see here, yeah, how much of a food they have, even if it is nutrient adequate food, the uh, absorption will not be adequate. Fluid and electrolyte imbalance, since there is uh, any chemotherapy drugs, okay? Uh, any, uh, uh, yeah, sure you can, uh, you can take live, no worries. Yeah. Uh, any form of uh, chemotherapy drugs, the, uh, what do you think is the most common side effect of chemotherapy drugs? Yeah. 
the instant and the most common side effect. Hair loss is still a latent side effect. Instant side effect means the day from which they start taking chemotherapy drug, that day itself they will see the side effect and most common side effect will be nausea and vomiting. And sometimes in some cases, excessive diarrhea will also be seen. So what happens here? Fluid electrolyte imbalance. When they're continuously vomiting, they're not keeping up uh, with the fluid intake. Okay, it will lead to fluid electrolyte imbalance. So that's in the uh, instant, okay? the day one of chemotherapy treatment you will see this side effect in all the cases most of the cases you will see they will not keep up the food which they had etc okay that's that's the most instantaneous side effect for chemotherapy drugs then anemia uh, some uh, cancer causing uh, viruses or agents and some drugs may lead to hemolysis Okay, hemolysis of the RBC. In that case, it will lead to anemia. Anemia may take time to show up. Okay, uh, if uh, signs and symptoms are overlooked, it may take time to show up. It can progress into the later stage of anemia. But yeah, drugs do have the side effects of bringing in anemia because of hemolysis. Hemolysis means breakdown of the RBCs. The taste and appetite change especially when uh, a person is receiving radiation therapy in the neck and head region, okay? In the neck and head region, when somebody is receiving radiation therapy, okay? In that case, they will, come, they will not even be able to distinguish between sweet and salt, okay? They will completely lose the sense of taste. So that will uh, lead to loss of appetite, etc especially when they're treating oral cancer, throat cancer, okay, when they're receiving radiation in these areas, complete loss of taste will, will be seen. Then learned food aversions. Learned food aversions. So uh, once, once a diagnosis is given to a person that they are in so-and-so stage of cancer, we can't uh, guarantee you complete cure, but we will try our best, something like that the oncologist have said. So that will instill some degree of fear, okay? And uncertainty, fear of death may also come into play, okay? So can you expect such person to have three times meals a day? A person who has just received the news that there is an uncertainty of how long they will live. Okay, so that, that's a psychological effect that cancer brings in, not just the physiological, but yeah, it's a psychological effect, okay? They will start avoiding food. They will be anorexic, okay? They don't, they don't find happiness in having food, okay? So that is seen. Then hypercalcemia, um, too much of calcium ions, free calcium ions circulating in the blood. It is not absorbed by the bones. It is not absorbed by the GI tract, okay? It, it will just be roaming around in the circulation. It may lead to some renal disorders also in the future. So that is hypercalcemia. Osteomalacia, again, the same thing. When uh, calcium ions are just being circulated in the blood, bones are not absorbing it. GI tract is not absorbing it. It will lead to softening of the bones because bones require calcium but they do not have the capacity to absorb calcium from the blood and deposit it in the uh, bone matrix in the, in the trabeculate. So it will lead to osteomalacia. So these are the general systemic reaction, reactions which we see in cancer patients. So nutritional problems, okay, so especially in cancer therapy, uh, surgical treatment, okay. Can you give me an example of what would be the difficulties people may have, especially uh, when they have removed a part of their tongue, a part of their, their jaw in oral cancer treatment, okay? What nutritional problems they may face? Can you put it in the chat box? Even when you go to a movie theater, 
okay you uh, before the movie th- uh, starts you sh- you, uh, you see the movie uh, of a short advertisement on mukesh and some other people who are suffering from you who had suffered from oral cancer because of smoking and tobacco etc okay people who have actually undergone the treatment for that surgery for that complete jaw removal complete or partial jaw removal complete glossectomy glossectomy means removal of tongue or part of the tongue just imagine the life of such people after the surgical treatment can they live a normal healthy life as before they cannot chew their food because the jaw is not present they cannot swallow okay they cannot drink okay they will be completely dependent on parental nutrition or tube feedings okay tube feeding that also uh, jejunostomy or gastrostomy completely parental nutrition or or tube feedings okay they are dependent their entire life will be dependent on that so that's one of the nutritional problems can tube feedings sat- completely satisfy one's uh, nutritional requirement for a prolonged period of time parental or tube feedings can it no it cannot okay you can expect a lot of deficiency you can expect a lot of nutritional insufficiency in such patients uh, in their future okay so that's the nutrition problem because of surgical treatment okay the same uh, this is the example which i gave about oral cancer okay the same can apply for gi cancer also if there is a, a malignant gi cancer you may have to remove a part of the stomach a part of the intestine okay uh, you may have to uh, undergo certain procedures for a long period of time again you will be on tube feeding etc okay or parenteral feeding so it can um, especially when a gi tract your gastrointestinal system is involved in malignancy okay you can expect a, lot, a big variety of range of nutritional problems then radiotherapy uh, as i told earlier when there is a radiation which has been exposed to the oropharyngeal area okay the head and neck area it will lead to a lot of signs and symptoms like glossitis inflammation of the tongue okay stomatitis the corners of your uh, lips okay the corners of your mouth will have blisters okay and uh, you you will your the taste the complete sense of taste will be gone you will not be differentiate between sweet sour the major taste okay leave let alone the textures okay so a version of food will be there so that's the kind of uh, problems we face with radiotherapy especially if uh, radiotherapy is uh, pointed at the head and neck region and abdominal radiation can cause any intestinal damage because in radiation therapy as we try as much as possible to attack only the malignant cells but along with that some of the healthy cells will also be destroyed okay that does happen so that is why we see some inflammation or some tissue damage in the other part of intestines because their intestinal tissues are very soft tissues so you have um, you cannot guarantee only killing or only destroying the cancer tissues some living healthy tissues may also get destroyed in the same process then chemotherapy again diarrhea nausea okay uh how much of a fluid diet you give them how much of a dry food that you give them they will first of all they will have aversion towards food because of so much of nausea and vomiting okay they are tired to even chew the food and that would lead to various deficiency and fluid electrolyte balance so that's the problem which you face with chemotherapy and chemotherapy drugs um we we would require lot of nutritional supplements with chemotherapy because chemotherapy drugs has been shown that they inhibit absorption of certain micronutrients okay from the food from the food chemotherapy drugs will try to inhibit the absorption of micronutrients so those who are under chemotherapy they will be prescribed uh, with some nutritional supplements to keep up with uh, to avoid any deficiency okay yeah hair loss is also there hair loss is, is still uh, uh, within within a week or two you will see hair loss with chemotherapy it's not on the same day but within a week or two you will see alopecia
So now nutritional requirement, okay. Uh, you can take a screenshot of this, the only important thing from this seg segment of nutritional requirement. So energy, if it's an adult patient who doesn't have any deficiency, but he or she uh, is uh, diagnosed with cancer, they can keep up, keep the energy level on a daily basis at 2000 kilocalories, okay? But if it's a patient who is, um, who is deficient, who, who is suffering from PEM, protein energy malnutrition, or any other deficiencies, on top of that, they are diagnosed with cancer, they can increase the intake of daily requirement of energy up to 3000 KCL, okay? This 2000 KCL is for the adult healthy person who, who, is, uh, who doesn't have any deficiency, but they are diagnosed with cancer. Till to, uh, to up to 2000 kilocalories, they can maintain. That is ideal for them. Protein intake should be around 80 to 100 grams uh, every day. And at least, even if uh, with, uh, with respect to the nausea, vomiting, and other side effects, anorexia, etc., what is being manifested, at, uh, if they are not able to key, uh, uh, handle 80 grams of proteins or protein per day, at least, at least 0 0.5 gram per kg weight of the person should be ingested. That, that's the minimum it has to be ingested. Okay, 80 to 100 is uh, still on the average to upper limit. But if the patient is not able to keep up this amount of protein, minimum 0 0.5 gram of protein per kg weight of the person should be given. Okay, micronutrients will be supplemented. Okay, physician, the oncologist will be prescribing what all micronutrients is required, multivitamins, etc. Those will be prescribed uh, along with the chemotherapy drugs or as 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 per the dosage, as per the frequency, what the oncologist has prescribed, nutrition supplements should be taken, okay? Even the whey protein that can be given. And fluid, whatever happens, dehydration should be avoided because then the therapies will not work. Dehydration should be avoided. And at, uh, to avoid that, minimum, minimum two liters of uh, water, or two liters of any kind of fluid, including all the tea, coffee, whatever they have, juices, whatever they have, including all this, minimum two liters of fluid should be uh, drank from uh, drank by these people. And uh, on top of that, um, avoid too much of the uh, caffeine because these are irritants. Because of certain irritations only, the person has got cancer. So avoid as much as irritants possible. Uh, one cup of tea or coffee per day can be given, okay? Not more than two. So uh, avoid such caffeines and irritants in the day-to-day -day diet. And the, the portion, you can follow this particular portion, which is given in the image, okay? Ha the a complete half of the plate should be filled with salad, vegetables, and fruits, okay? Com uh, take a plate, divide it into half. That much should be the serving of fruits and vegetables, okay? Um, then... The other half, again, divided into two parts. One part will be of protein. One part will be of carbohydrates. That's it. That's you. That's how you can plan the diet for cancer patient. Uh, avoid caffeinated drinks. Avoid caffeinated drinks. Caffeinated drinks or any, any uh, irritants in the food. Too much of spicy food. Don't give them too much of spicy fit, uh, food, etc. Okay. Anything that can irritate their GI tract. Okay. Like too much of spicy, too much of fatty food. Okay. Too much of caffeine, uh, too much of free sugars. Okay. Avoid that. Okay. Then coming to the dietary management of side effects. Uh, please, uh, those who have the textbook on page number 494. For uh, a table is given, table 23.3, okay, on page number 494. Very nicely, they have given various side effects that you can expect during the cancer therapy and how to manage this particular side effect. Okay, what kind of food has to be given, what has to be avoided. Very nicely, they have given in this particular table, table 23.3 on page number 494, okay. So when you are having nausea and, uh, and vomiting, Car even carbonated beverage can be given. Can you give me the reason why, why you can give carbonated beverages or any cold, clear, uh, 
sugar rich beverages when when one is suffering from nausea and vomiting The carbohydrate uh, beverages can produce uh, acid reflux also because all that gas will fill up the fundus of the stomach so that as much as possible the fluid will stay in the stomach. On top of that, from the nutritional point of view, from the nutritional point of view, what would be the answer for this? Carbo uh, carbonated sugar rich beverages. Yes, correct for energy. The sugar which is there in this carbonated uh, beverages that will be very easily absorbed by the GI tract. Okay, instead of uh, or you can give them glucose biscuits also. Okay, glucose bi biscuits, anything that has free sugars. Okay, simple sugars, things that have simple sugars, give them that because they require instant energy and these things can provide them instant energy. Okay, if their energy uh, factor is not met, the body will go to the muscles to take up the energy from protein stores. Okay, that will lead to muscle wasting, etc. That's another complication. For instant energy, carbonated beverages are a good thing to keep, uh, to control the nausea and vomiting, as well as to give them instant energy. Okay. Then for dry mouth, at least two liters of water daily. Okay. And uh, whatever food you prepare, Try, try to prepare it in gravy form, okay, in a porridge form, in pudding, pudding forms, etc. Instead of giving them dry food, uh, try to give them like semi liquid, liquid chilies, okay. If you are giving them uh, uh, rice and some curry, make sure the curry has a lot of watery gravy content to it, okay, that can solve this issue. Uh, after having carbonated drink, you should not lie, lie on your back, okay? You have to sit straight. So that's how carbonated drinks like. If you are having some gas issue or something, they tell you to have soda something, sodas, okay? Why? Because soda can take the gastroenteritis along with the, carbo, uh, of the, along with the carbonated uh, gases in that and it will come out of the uh, stomach, keeping the fluid in the stomach. Only the gases will come out of the uh, out through through the butts okay so that's how these drinks work and they have this carbonated drinks have high amount of sugar okay they are very sugary and they have high amount of sugar so it satisfies the purpose here then taste alteration when they do not feel any taste or something experiment with new textures of food okay experiment with new types of food new sauces something like that but remember sauces should not be Irritating, okay. Home cooked sauces and all are very good option here. Loss of appetite, small and frequent feedings. Sore mouth and sore throat, okay. Um, avoid acidic food like uh, like lime juice, etc. Or orange juice, which are acidic in nature. Avoid that. Uh, am I audible? Am I audible now? Okay, so yeah, for loss of appetite, small frequent meals, uh, if somebody is having sore throat or, so, or sore mouth, give them non-acidic food, like don't give them too much of uh, fruit juices, Okay, fruit juices are uh, comparatively acidic. So avoid fruit juices, too much of fruit juices. Those who are having swallowing problems, avoid highly seasoned food like tempering the food or, or like or having a lot of chalk in the food. Okay, avoid that. Early uh, satiety means, uh, for example, even with one chapati, they feel completely full. Okay or with half a chapati, they will feel completely full. They don't want to eat, uh, eat anymore. 
but their target is to have at least two chapatis but within half a chapati they feel completely satiated okay so to relieve that again small and frequent uh, meals that can make sure that even with small portions their complete calorie count is under check and they are reaching up to their mediated calories okay so please follow the table in on page number 494 table 23.3 it's very easy it, it will give you complete guide, guide, guidance on how to tackle various side, side effects of this therapy then yeah nutritional supplements you can give them commercially available supplements with uh, with the prescription what exactly the doctor has prescribed that particular supplements commercially which is commercially available you can give them whey protein is also useful because most most of the time the high protein food will not be ingested by them they may have certain aversions to it so whey protein can be given to them and uh, these are different types of mushrooms which are known to have anti inflammatory properties okay and they can calm and cool down the irritation in the in the gastric system okay gi system so reishi mushroom may take mushroom and button mushroom so here uh, you can see in the far right side the red color mushroom maroonish reddish color mushroom that's the reishi mushroom you have the image in the book also on page number 496 the reddish one the reddish brownish one that is the reishi mushroom and the maitake the the one which looks like a human brain okay that's the uh, maitake uh, mushroom and then you have button mushrooms white button mushrooms is preferred more uh, here i have shown with the uh, image of brown button uh, button mushrooms on top okay so these are the different types of mushrooms with known anti inflammatory property you can add them also in the meal plan if it is available you can add them in the meal plan meal plan so cancer preventing food okay this is before the cancer starts so obviously the antioxidants um, vitamins the vitamin e c k are known to be antioxidants in their function okay mineral called selenium has good antioxidant property all forms of carotenoids beta carotene lutein lycopene etc they are antioxidants phytochemicals phytochemicals uh, we have another slide for that you can take a screenshot of this also on page number 498 table 23.5 different types of phytochemicals no need to by heart the names of these phytochemicals okay no need to by heart the names of the phytochemicals in uh, seafood you will get selenium okay seafood is a rich source of selenium yeah about the phytochemicals um do do no need to by heart the names of this phytochemicals just read uh, in which which are the food sources which will give you a good source of phytochemicals and that will help okay yeah at the end of the class i will show all the slides together at that time you can take the screenshot okay please wait for that i guess uh, more or less the same uh, same uh, table the contents of the uh, this table which i'm showing on screen is similar to the ones which is given in the textbook on page number 498 yeah selfish it's a seafood it's a non vegetarian source for vegetarians any bean sources okay like soybean uh, pumpkin seeds any vegetable oil seeds okay those are good sources of selenium so for phytochemicals you you have the sources also turmeric and all it is very usual most commonly used in indian food etc different kind of berries berries have flavonoids tea also have flavonoids beans legumes 
you can see here a variety of flavonoids uh, sorry a variety of phytochemicals is found in most of the fruits and vegetables okay it's less commonly found in legumes and seeds etc but all citrus fruits or any other berries okay they're rich in antioxidants as well as phytochemicals then we have prebiotics and probiotics okay uh, can anyone uh, uh, explain like i have done this long time ago uh, old students okay can anyone explain what is prebiotics biotics and probiotics Yeah, prebiotics. Pre pre means it's the food that will give nutrition to the microflora which is present in your stomach. Okay, like lactobacillus, E. coli. Okay, which is present in your stomach and intestine. Prebiotics are the food that will not just give you the nutrition, but it will also give nutrition for the microflora which is present in the gut. Okay, that is prebiotic. Probiotic means what? It is already made up microflora synthesized, which is synthesized outside the body, like in food like curds, yogurt, buttermilk, etc. Okay, so that is probiotic that is already manufactured, uh, made up uh, probiotics, which you can ingest, uh, especially when your gut doesn't have good microflora or doesn't have enough microflora. Okay, your your intestine and your uh, stomach doesn't have enough good bacteria okay at that time probiotics will help you it is already good bacteria which you are ingesting prebiotic is the nutrition for the existing bacteria good bacteria in your gut that's the difference okay the examples you can see here uh, wheat flour or wheat bran both are good probiotic good nutrition for your probiotics garlic banana okay especially green bananas uh, then for probiotic, it, it is already available in, in ma market. Is also it is available like uh, Yakut etc. Okay, yogurt, probiotic milk, sour cream. Okay, kefir. That's an uh, middle uh, Middle Eastern delicacy. Okay, curd you can use in India. You can use curd. You can use buttermilk. Okay, and these are the probiotic uh, food. Along with the meal also you can have, okay, like if you're having buttermilk and curd, along with the meal also you can have, it will not destroy the lactobacilli, okay. Before the food is also good, it, it can prepare the gut, it can calm down the gut, uh, it can prevent any unwanted inflammation. So probiotics will also help in reducing your risk for any colon cancer or any stomach cancers, okay. Then resistant starch. Resistant starch has been uh, linked up with colon cancer. When you increase the intake of resistant starch rich food in your diet, uh, the risk of colon cancer decreases. Okay. So the resistant starch is inversely proportional to colon cancer. So these are the uh, different sources, good sources of resistant starch beans, brown rice green bananas, lentils, like tuwar dal, moong dal, etc. Okay, uh, misli cereals, oats, potatoes, etc. Good sources of resistant starch. They can prevent colon cancer. Then dietary fiber. Mainly it will protect you against colon cancer because dietary fi fiber, when uh, taken in limited quantities, it can stay in your intestine, it can undergo fermentation, okay, fermentation that takes place in intestine is very important because fermentation uh, will lead to secretion of certain enzymes, okay, it will lead to secretion of certain enzymes, and that enzymes can prevent anti-carcinogenesis, 
that can take place in your body. It can prevent certain genetic mutation, etc. Okay. Resistant uh, starch, it it doesn't uh, completely dissolve or it, it will it will not completely get absorbed in the gut. Okay, it takes time. It's a uh, it's a, a complex kind of carbohydrates. Protects against colon cancer, uh, dietary fiber. Okay, it prevents gastrointestinal disease, con controls high cholesterol, reduces inflammation, aids in weight loss. It can also treat fiber. Then insulin resistance. Uh, insulin resistance means uh, when when you increase your intake of food that are that have high glycemic index. Okay, like that that are glucose rich food, which are quite rich in carbohydrates. Okay, which has high glycemic index. Uh, on a on a prolonged period of time when you ingest this kind of food okay what happens is your pancreas will be secreting lot and lot 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 of insulin okay in, in huge amounts and there comes a time then that the pancreas gets exhausted of uh, secreting so much of insulin in, uh, the insulin which is secreted in the blood is also so high but it is uh, it is not able to bring down the glucose level okay so that is insulin resistance even those who are suffering from pcod's any any kind of ovarian disorders um, the uh, ovarian or female reproductive disorders they have high chance of being in the stage of insulin resistant okay if you treat your insulin resistant automatically various symptoms of the pcod's will also subside Okay, so it not uh, uh, treating insulin resistant not just helps to prevent PCODs or co controlling the PCOD symptoms, but if if you suffer from insulin resistant, if you take uh, or uh, in a very uh, correct time when you when you try to correct your insulin resistance, it can prevent cancer also because uh, increased insulin resistance because of obesity, uh, ingesting too much of high glycemic index food, you will be under the stage of insulin resistance. And uh, whatever, how much of our insulin the pancreas is secreting into the bloodstream, your uh, glucose level is not coming down. Your blood glucose level doesn't come down. Your blood will always stay hyperglycemic. It can lead to diabetes and other uh, disorders. And along with high blood glucose level, you will have high insulin levels also. But these insulin levels is not able to combat or bring down the glucose level so it both of these things glucose and insulin will be high in your body okay and it will lead to a lot of increased cell uh, differentiation proliferation usually your pancreas your pancreas will think that i have only this much cells and i'm secreting so much of insulin it is not working let me proliferate let me differentiate let me bring lots of cells so that i can give more insulin out so that's how that's the stage what your pancreas will go into so that will lead to increased cell proliferation and finally you may end up with cancer okay so that's how insulin resistance will lead to cancer